in chapter number 22 today. Revelation chapter number 22. Just give me a moment here. All right. Revelation chapter number 22. Back in the late 1800s, there was an evangelist by the name of D.L. Moody. He's famous for his campaigns both here in the United States and, and uh, the UK. Anyways, one time he said, I never preach a sermon without thinking the possibility that are thinking about the possibility that the Lord may come before I preach another time. And we would say with that statement that Deal Moody lived with a proper perspective of reality, which includes both what we would know as the seen world or the unseen world, as you will. He lived with eternity constant in view because he understood the certainty of all God says that will come to pass. And the series we've been in here at this hour, The Prophetic Perspective, was designed to help us get a perspective about what we see happening around us and how it's all going to end. To get a, a good sense of reality, if you will. Not everything seen is all of reality, because there's a lot behind the scenes we don't see, but it's just as much part of reality. And if we've been saved, we see that it will all end well for us, even though we may be in difficult times now. Knowing the future also gives us perspective on what is important to live for now. So we avoid wasting our lives on things that in the whole scope of things really are worthless. <laughs> you know, we don't want to invest and pour our whole life into something that ends up being absolutely worthless. And, and, uh, and mean nothing and, and will eventually just become dust. Well, today we're going to close out our series. And I'd like to sum up our series with some final words of admonition to be faithful to the Lord in these days, regardless of what other people do, because what we have studied is certain to come to pass, just as certain as we are sitting here today. Revelation 22, just two verses today. Verse 6, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. This morning, let's consider this thought of the certainty of these things. The certainty of these things. Let's go ahead and pray first. Father, we thank you for all that we've been able to study at this hour. We thank you for the lessons on prophecy and, and your plans really for the future. And Lord, we thank you for the fact that uh, we are on the winning side if we are yours, if we've been saved. And Lord, that is a great privilege to have. And Lord, I pray that we could put things in proper context in life and proper perspective so that we know how to make right choices and go forward for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, over the course of this series, we've studied many of the high points of what is referred to as Bible prophecy. We've spent a number of time looking at uh, different highlights and points, and we could have gotten a lot deeper into it. I didn't want to get into the, a, a, a whole lot of deep, deep things, if you will, but, uh, but I did want to at least hit some of the high points so we kind of just get an understanding a little bit of some of the things that God has on docket for this world and, and things are, that are kind of really, at a moment's notice, could... Uh, could be uh, happening, if you would. God again, Bible prophecy is simply God's plan to usher out, out or to usher out sin and its perpetrators, and usher in a restored kingdom of righteousness to restore things as He would want them to be, or what He had initially designed them to be, if He would. It's very helpful to understand that God has a plan in it all, isn't it? In a world where our lives can feel like it's they're up in chaos, and the, and the world out there can look like it's up in chaos, really, God knows exactly what He's doing, and He's got everything under complete control. And that's that's what we see as we study prophecy. That everything is not out of control, even though it appears to us that way at times. God's got it all under control. He knows what He's doing. He's got a plan, and He's working that plan. The world we see is becoming an increasing mess, as we know, just like the Scriptures tell us. 1 Timothy 3, 1 says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And with an increasing population and advancement of technology, sin is going to rapidly multiply in this world, which it is. Though God's people may feel at times there is very little hope, God again has proved us, or provided us with assurance 
through these, uh, these studies, at least what we see out of his word, that there is a blessed hope. And that blessed hope is imminent. It, it can happen before we finish our service. It could happen before we get to the end of this week, or the end of this month, or the end of this year. And that blessed hope has everything to do with his return to this earth. And we've studied the events surrounding his return from the rapture, the seven-year tribulation period that follows some of the major characters involved in that period, the millennial kingdom to the great white throne. And we see that God is at work and based on his past credibility is certain to usher these things in. Regardless of how we might put it this way, how far out they might seem. And some of the things you look at in prophecy, they seem a little far out, don't they? <laughs> they do to me. The idea of a rapture, of people just suddenly disappearing off the earth. The idea of a tribulation period where the world is going to become a one entity and there's going to be mass deaths and persecutions like uns ever seen before. There's going to be things that are happening, geologically speaking, that are far worse than what we see now. I mean, just some far out things. And then you got this idea of a millennial kingdom where Jesus Christ is actually going to bodily reign from Jerusalem and a great white throne judgment. I mean, just all this stuff. We've never seen anything like it. But just because we haven't physically seen it doesn't mean it's true. God has given us a more sure word of prophecy, as Peter mentions. And he has proven the credibility of himself by giving us other prophecies that have come to pass and have long since uh, uh, has, have shown how credible he truly is. And as credible as God has worked in past things, he is certain to usher in the things we've studied, regardless of how far out they may seem. And God wants his people to have comfort and confidence in him regarding these things. I like what Paul told the, the Thessalonican Christians after he, after he reminded them of the return of the Lord and that rapture, if you will. He said in 1 Thessalonians 4.18, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This is supposed to be a comfort to us. That God is doing things, even though it might seem like Christianity at times and the people of God have their backs against the wall because of the, of the pervading wickedness of the world. Again, it's very easy to get stressed out, disoriented, and disillusioned by life looking at the world around, but God wants us to see things from His viewpoint because it, it'll bring joy, peace, and purpose to our existence now. God wants us every day living with eternity in view as it gives us perspective in which, in which we are to live our lives. And understanding the events we see is meant to educate and motivate us to live dogmatically for Him. Not half-heartedly, but dogmatically. Above all else. Because one day, only things for Him are all that's going to matter. Go to 2 Peter chapter number 3. This, this chapter I've referenced periodically throughout the series. But it, it gives a great synopsis of now. <laughs> Of now, how time has passed, and and uh, the the Lord has returned, to, promised to return, and there are those in the last days that will scoff at that, which we have today, and there's a lot of scoffing going on against the Word of God and Christianity as a whole, and so forth. But that was to come to pass, as God is waiting and waiting and waiting for the world to come back to Him, waiting for those that will respond to His message of salvation. But there's going to come a point. When that's going to finish. And that's going to be done. And it's going to usher in the remaining part of God's plan. Verse 10, 2 Peter 3. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night suddenly, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of the God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. We notice here that when, when the Lord finally comes back, all these things that everyone's living for and trying to build up in this world are going to one day just be dissolved. It's all going to be dissolved. All the things that people have clamored at and, and made gods out of and, and have said, this is what you live for in this world, that's all going to be gone. They're not going to talk about who won the Super Bowl. They're not going to talk about who won the NBA Finals. They're not going to talk about who's the, who's the number one CEO uh, of the country. They're not going to talk about who's the richest man in the world is. They're not going to talk about who got elected to office. They're not going to talk about that anymore. 
That's all going to be forgotten as uh, one day. That's all going to burn up. Everything, everyone dreams of being in this and dreams of attaining in this world, that'll be gone except that which was put forth for the eternal. That's why it says, seeing that all these things shall be dissolved. In other words, all this world is going to be burned up. It's going to go, what manner of person ought you ought to be in holy conversation and godliness? In other words, it ought to affect the way you live now. It should. It's meant to. If we realize that everything that, that this world says is what, what it is to live for is not going to be around anymore, but the things that are eternal, it only makes logical sense in our hearts, or at least it should, that we would invest as highly as we can and as much as we can in the eternal. When we realize this above else, it does affect the way we live significantly. What we invest in and what we do with our lives. And that's a big decision for us to make, isn't it? We are confronted every single day of our lives with that decision, whether we realize it or not. And I know there have been people in the past who have literally walked away from the opportunity to be rich, famous, powerful, etc. Just simply to serve the Lord Jesus Christ because they believe the certainty of the things that we've looked at. People have literally given up their own physical lives because they believed in the certainty of the things that we look at. The question is today, how certain are we about what's to come? It'll play out by what we invest our lives in. The more we believe the certainty of God's eternal plans, the more we'll give ourselves to be part of them. And today, let's consider some final thoughts to hopefully help motivate us to, I guess, say, this is what I want to pour the rest of my life into in some regards. Regardless of where God places me and puts me, this is what I want to invest myself into because these things are certain. And if they're certain, they're worthy of my best effort towards helping them come to reality or to, to fruition, if you will. First off, let's talk about the speed of, the, of these things. The speed. Now, the language of our text tells us these events that God speaks of, ones we deem still prophetic, are certain to come to pass. And to come to pass speedily. In fact, if you go back there to Revelation chapter 22, we see in verse number 6, And he said unto me, These things are, are faithful, are, these sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which, notice, must shortly be done. Must shortly be done. Look at verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Now skip to verse 10. We'll see a few other verses outside of our text. It says, at the end of verse 10, For the time is at hand. Verse 12. It says, Behold, I come quickly. Look at verse number 20. It says, uh, Surely I come quickly. Doesn't it communicate a little bit in these few verses, just within this last chapter of the book of Revelation, that God is meaning these things to come to pass in a speedy manner. God's not dragging his feet. This is a hasty thing. This is a thing that is meant to be given, done in haste. You know, like David said back in the, I think it's 1 Samuel, where he said, I, or, I can't remember how it goes now, um, the king's business requires haste. That's what it was. The king's business requires haste. And, and, and John here is finishing off the book of Revelation, the last book that's going to be penned. And there's an urgency about this whole process. Like, God's saying, this stuff's going to come to pass pretty quickly here. It's going to come to pass. And hence, God's people need to have an urgency about them, about doing His work. You know, it's not time to lollygag around and, you know, should I serve God? Should I not? Oh, I don't know. I'm kind of, it's a little inconvenient. I might miss an hour of sleep. God help me. You know, or is there an urgency about what, what it is that God has us to be here for? Because this stuff that we're talking about, it's going to come on us speedily. Well, pastor, don't you understand that this book was penned around 95 A.D. and Boy, it's been somewhere around 1,900 years. That doesn't sound very speedy to me. 
Well, one might not say that, or one might say that doesn't seem very speedy, but in the whole scope of eternity, this time period is but a moment. It's actually quite short because God's speaking from His perspective. Go to 2 Peter 3 again. We'll see a few other verses that I didn't read. But this is not, even though it appears to be a long time for us, this isn't a long time to God. This is, this is happening pretty quickly. He's commencing His plans. Again, you got to look at this from the scope of eternal perspective. Not, not the way we see time. 2 Peter chapter number 3, and verse 3, it says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. See, that's the mindset we are in danger of getting. We can start scoffing. In the sense of, you know, it's taken a long time. You know, we're, you know come on God, let's go. But again, that we need to have a proper perspective, not our personal perspective. A proper perspective comes from God. Because he explains himself further. It says, for, they this, for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water, and in the water, and whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So think about it. We have, it hasn't been quite 2,000 years, maybe, since the end of Revelation. And to God, it's just kind of finishing up the second day. Just kind of finishing up that second day. From God's perspective, this hasn't gone on very long. To ours, yeah, it seems that way, but we have a different perspective on time than God does. But to God, this is happening very, very fast. This is a very speedy, speedy thing. And as we've seen, God is very merciful, waiting for people to turn to Him during this time period. Look at verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, who are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, God's given a space of time. To us, seems like a long time, but to Him, it seems very short. And He's giving, though, as much human time, if you will, that we can, or He can, so that people will consider their ways and turn back to Him and get right. Because he's not willing that anybody faces that great white throne judgment we talked about here a week or so ago. The point I like to make, though, is that God, to God, this period of time in comparison to how we judge time has only been like a couple days. Not long at all, though it may seem long to us from our perspective. And to God, he's going to bring the stuff that we've studied to a close pretty quickly. Because he doesn't want this sin blot of time to go on any longer than it has to. Which means several things to us. Again, is that if we need to get some things settled with God, that we best do it. We best do it here pretty soon. We, we best not dawdle with it, if you will. You know, if it's salvation, then it's best that we get this thing settled between Him and Him and us. If you've never been saved, if you don't know what that means, then it means that you need to start seeking that and getting that figured out and taking that seriously. Well, I'll just kind of, you know, haphazardly. No, this thing requires some haste here. Because you don't know the day you're going to die. You don't know if the Lord will come back before the end of this day. So, oh, well, he hasn't come back yet. Are we talking like those last day scoffers that Peter mentioned about? Oh, the reality, of, the certainty of these things tells us that He can come back at any moment. That's the way He tells us to be and to respond to His Word. That this, is gonna, this stuff's going to come to pass. Hence, we must respond as we have this space of grace to do so. And we need to get some things settled with God. We best do it. Because the commencement of these events are imminent. And how much closer we must be now, 1900 years later. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're that much closer than we've ever been. And if we've been wondering, what do we do with our lives? Well, give them to Him to use. 
John 9, 4, Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. We're in the day, if you will. But there's coming a night where there no man can work. If you want to know where to invest your life, invest it in the things of God. Well, I don't feel called to be a minister, a pastor, a missionary. You don't have to be. God's giving you time and giving you a place to work and people to reach within your circle of influence that you can reach. There are ministries that you can be involved with. Pour your life into that. Give God your very all. Because the, the time period is short. The setting of the sun is taking place, so to say, on, on this time period. God's giving us space, but that space is coming to an end at some point. And you see things going on in our world that, that's, that line up with the Bible and the way, the way the Bible predicts certain things are going to happen. It's just like, it could be any moment. Hence, as God's people, it's, we must have an urgency about us saying, you know, if God says this is going to take place speedily, I've got this time right now. I best use it to the best of my ability for Him. Because if you're going to live for Christ, you need to do it now. Not tomorrow, not next week. Well, tomorrow, I guess, technically. But you, you, know, you know what I mean. <laughs> you, must, you can live today, too, whatever the case might be. But the whole point is this. Don't dawdle with it. Oh, I'll do that next year when I get done with this and that. You know what? Maybe start getting rid of some of that stuff that just doesn't mean anything anymore. And so We get so caught up and so entrenched and so entangled in this life. Now, Paul told Timothy, don't get entangled with the affairs of this life. But please him who's called you to be a soldier. Hey, if you're going to live for Christ, you need to do it now. Don't dawdle, don't delay. Find a place which God has for you and do it with all your heart. Because God's in the process of wrapping things up and it's our time at bat, if you will. Don't go to your grave thinking, oh, I should have given God more. I think we'll all say that, but there are some people that are going to have a lot of regret because they do not invest their life in anything but themselves, their, their jobs, their careers, their, their play times, their everything like that. And that's what they think life's all about. Life isn't all about that. Those are some perks along the way, but, we, but what our life focus, what should be within our heart is, how can I live for Him? How can I advance His cause? Because these things that He's talked about are going to come, come about very speedily. And hence, I must have an urgency about who I am and my, my time while I'm here. If we are hoping for any eternal rewards, we best be investing now. Don't waste life on the temporary dream as much as we are investing in eternal dividends. Because there are some real eternal dividends out there. This prophetic stuff is on the horizon. Do what you and I, we, or we need to do, or whatever we need to do with God right now, we need to do and not delay. Whatever that might be. Secondly, let's talk about the sureness. The sureness. Go back to Revelation 22. Revelation chapter 22. The sureness of this. Look at verse 6. Again, these sayings, the things that John just wrote about, all these things that he gleaned, everything that we, we studied, whether it's in Revelation or our connection with it, these sayings are what? Faithful and true. Faithful and true. The sayings mentioned here are in reference to what John was told and what we have in the book of Revelation and beyond. And John is hearing from the Lord that everything he's been told is faithful and true. It's faithful and true. In other words, there is not one ounce of falsehood in any of it. There is, uh, there is no embellishing of the, of the details. Nothing is wrong about it. It's absolute, positively as true as God can be. Everything that he said. Even though John really didn't understand everything, and we only stand parts of it, we do know one thing. There is a sureness about what God has told will come to pass. Again, as far as some of the details have appeared to John, everything is going to, to happen just as it was dictated to him. And God wants us to understand, I believe, the sureness of these plans. As people, we can make plans. However, plans can change, sometimes due to no fault of ours. 
But that's never the case with God. Everything God states always comes to pass. Even the impossible, even the improbable, even the unlikely. God has a way of bringing things to pass that no man could ever do. Because nothing's impossible for God to, to do. Nothing, hence nothing he says is false. God has subjected himself to his word. Psalm 138 verse 2, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness, for thy truth. Get the last part here. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. God has set himself in, in subjection to his own word. So everything God says he has to come through with, lest he be not God. And there's some things God has really kind of put in his word at times in the past. And even for some of this, these future prophecies, that honestly is like, that is humanly impossible. But God still brought it to pass and still did it. To every little nook and cranny. God's credibility and character are put on the line with these prophecies. However, if you're a student of scriptures, you see God has given prophecies that seem difficult, again, to understand or even to come to pass. But God, again, predicted with pinpoint accuracy and brought everything to pass according to what he says. Dr. George Sweeting once estimated that more than a fourth of the Bible is predictive prophecy, but the old, both the Old and New Testaments are full of promises about the return of Jesus Christ. Over 1,800 references appear in the Old Testament, and 17 Old Testament books give prominence to this theme. Of the 260 chapters in the, uh, in the New Testament, there are more than 300 references to the Lord's return, one out of every 30 verses. 23 of the 27 New Testament books refer to the great event. For every prophecy on the first coming of Christ, there are eight on Christ's second coming. I think there are somewhere in the vicinity of 330 some prophecies or so given of Christ's first coming. Every one of them given are met with pinpoint accuracy. If God was good enough to do that, he, can, he is certainly good enough to come through with everything He says about the future. You know, we spent some time here studying the book of Daniel. And Daniel receives some Amazing prophecies about the, the future of world kingdoms. You know, kingdoms that nobody had any idea would ever come to pass, especially in those days. And even Daniel, as he penned down some of these things, didn't understand what he was writing about. But as we studied and, and as you look back in history, you see how God, again, predicted things, particularly chapter 11 of Daniel. It is uncanny the accuracy of what God predicted between two warring factions. It was a, we, we call it today a soap opera that took place in these, in these times. And, and, was, and all the twists and turns of, of different things that took place in God, in Daniel chapter 11, predicted everyone to the T, to the point where even Bible critics say that this chapter could not have been penned before this all took place, but it had been. In fact, years and years and years before it even happened. And based on the fact God can predict that and, and, come, and we can look at history and see how accurate God was then, how much more can we bank then now on what he says about what's to come? That's the whole point. Because God knows and can orchestrate things as he sees fit. Go to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 46. Isaiah 46, these verses communicate God's ability to, to bring about things and can predict the end from the beginning. Isaiah 46, verse 9, it says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. In other words, he knows what, exactly what's going to happen before it even happens. He can predict the, the end result from the very beginning. From the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country. Yea, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. 
There is not a thing on planet earth or any man can ever do to stop the counsel and the will of God. Satan has been trying to do that for centuries. Since he rebelled against God, he has been trying to stop God from doing his plan to fulfilling things. But you know what? Every time it seems like the devil's going to win, God kind of reverses it and he, and he comes out on top and the devil has egg on his face every last time. And you know what? People in this world can plan and plot and try to do everything they can to stop God and stop His Word and, and try to subvert it and suppress it and burn it and ban it and, and, and banish it and all that kind of stuff. But the Word of God has always stood and will stand and these prophecies will come to pass regardless of what happens in this world. In fact, all the things that happen help orchestrate bringing those things to come to pass. That's the way God works. That's exactly what he, he's proven to do. And God wants us to understand the great sureness of this. That you and I can bank upon this. And we can build our lives upon the things that we know. And we can make better decisions than those that are ignorant out there of the very truths that we're, we've studied. Because these very things we've studied should impact our lives in a very significant way. And if they don't, it's because we are not believing them. We don't believe they're true. We don't believe they're true at all. God can tell you the end from the beginning, the sureness of His Word, to the point that we can bank every life decision upon it. And God's proving over and over again the immobility of His counsel, that He does not lie. As impossible and as far out as some things may appear, if God sells it, the old saying goes, that settles it, right? That settles it. There's a sureness to God's prophecies as God has successfully expounded things in times past that were future at the time of their writing, even in some cases centuries earlier. But yet God accurately was able to do that. And as a result, we can bank on, on the future things that He has revealed to us now. And if, these, if that is the case, then these things we've studied in this prophecy series we should take very, very seriously. We should take extremely seriously, because this is serious stuff. We're talking about the eternal situations of people. You know, that great white throne and that lake of fire is not a pretty picture, but that thing is going to come to pass. But in order to help people avoid that, that place, God needs His people urgent about His business now. As we talk about thirdly and finally, the seriousness. God doesn't want us dismissing these things as much as He wants us living accordingly based on their knowledge of them. Again, back in verse 7 of Revelation 22. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Blessed, happy, joyous are those... They keep the sayings. In other words, they respond to what God has said. They take it seriously. We live in a day and age where, the, where God's Word isn't taken very seriously, even amongst God's people sometimes. We don't take it seriously. We, we, we're, we're like, you know, we, we kind of take it haphazard because we got, we got our things to do. It's not the way we're suppo it's supposed to be. You know, when we, read these, when we read these things and we say, whoa, it ought to mo motivate us with fear and trembling, to live for Him and do our best to help those that need to hear. I think of Noah. When God told him that flood was going to hit. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that he, he moved with fear. Because he took God very, very seriously. He said, God, God's serious about this. I've never seen rain, but God said it's going to rain. Back in those days, it didn't rain. The water came up from underneath the ground. That's why the rest of the world was thought it was a mockery. But Noah moved with fear. He moved with some urgency. He moved with some fervency. He moved with some seriousness. And he faced all that he did in the scrutiny, no doubt, he received. Because he knew the sureness of what God had said. That's the exact same thing we are supposed to be responding to now. Hence, we need to take it seriously. We need to take it very seriously. The blessed people, the blessed people are those that, that knowing the truth about the future, live appropriately, live in the light of it, 
and that this knowledge sets the boundaries of their priorities of what is what is right and what is wrong what they get themselves involved with and what they hold themselves back from living any less than that shows that we do not take God seriously does it I mean that's what you have to conclude if we if if we're not like that it's like then it shows, shows God you know not really taking this whole seriously and that's not what God wants it's a very grievous mistake again how serious do we take God today how serious do we take him you know again if we're unsaved do you believe what he said about the future is true if you do you'll come you'll come racing to that cross wanting to be saved it's the unbelief that you that you can somehow get beyond beyond that or somehow get around it that's gonna that's gonna hinder you from responding the way you're supposed to you know what is it that holds you back from being saved today if you've never been saved there if this is certainty boy the future doesn't look good for you but God wants it to be good for you but you have to be willing to respond to him and if you are saved is living for him your greatest priority and driving motivation every day it should be I don't care if you work a job I don't care if you're retired I don't care what's standing in life I don't care if you're a child just going to school our motivation every day for everything we do ought to be I'm trying to do something for him I want to use whatever avenue he's given me uh, the, the the job that he's given me the, the position in life he's given me to do something for him and that ought to be the driving motivation that gets us up every morning because it'll give you a real reason to live anything less than that will cut short our lives it will cut short in the sense of its seriousness and purpose and when you lose purpose in life then you lose the reason to live and that's not the way God has a purpose a real one a serious one based on the things that he shows us from his word about what's to come and may we make that our purpose in the day in which we live may God help us understand the great certainty of these things of Bible prophecy because it it dictates a lot about our lives about the decisions that we make going forward may God help us to do so today let's stand to our feet this morning